So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Pitch Pack, uh, courtesy of Pitch Pack under Planet Fitness. And today we have a Juneteenth special, which is called Liberation, Breaking the Binds in Diet and Self-Care. So, here we go into our intro. Before we start this presentation, this evening we have Quinn Mason, who is the owner of Quintessential Solutions. She's a food relationship expert and lactation specialist. She helps individuals establish a healthier relationship with food by adapting a positive attitude towards food, where you can eat what you want without the guilt. Who doesn't love that? Quinn has been a registered dietitian since 2012. She believes food is a healer and our best medicine. Before we use food to heal, you have to develop a healthy relationship with it. So welcome, Quinn. A little bit about myself. I'm the founder of Chronic Fitness. For those who don't already know, I'm a former athletic product developer manager who has now built a business in fitness in the fitness arena for people with chronic related health challenges. I work with clients to attain a sustainable life and health in educating them on diet and environmental exposures that impact their journey. We do not set superficial goals and barking on a fitness journey may might not be the easiest thing to do, but I believe it is definitely a step closer to your dream. So, um, so this evening in celebration of Juneteenth month, or which is June 19th, so in light of the emancipation of 1865, which was 157 years ago, um, don't know about you, but that really wasn't that long ago. It was long ago, but it wasn't that long ago. So we start with, or actually, you know, skip a few screens. Um, okay. So we start with the West Africa, where our diet included those of the following. As we see here on this screenshot, we have plant-based foods, we have fruits and greens, and we only have a small portion of meat. So this was the diet of West Africa back in the day, okay, which, this type of diet prepares you for low risk of ailments, not to, go, not to go, or not too good. The weights and equipments were not what we know of them today. It was enough to gain strength and physical activity through working on plantations from sundown to sundusk. Bending, walking, carrying, running, and dancing. So let's talk about how we change our mentality and how we think about food and how we think of exercise with the available tools that we do have today. So let's start with you, Quinn. Well, good evening, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. I hope you had a wonderful week and leading into this glorious weekend. And I'm, I just want to thank you, Yolanda, for inviting me on here. I'm so excited to talk about this topic today. So as she introduced, my name is Quinn Mason of Quintessential Solutions. I am a registered dietitian and food relationship specialist. So what that means is I help people 
build that healthy relationship with food. And more importantly, I help them find that disconnect between knowing what to eat and actually putting it on your plate and getting it into your body. So that looks like understanding why you are um, drawn to certain foods, why you usually gravitate um, towards certain types of foods, even though we know we should be eating like some healthier options, um, but we just don't honestly you just don't feel like eating it right because other foods taste better so why are we uh what is that um connection that we have to that food so that's what i help my clients figure out and then we use that information to like reframe reshape their diet so it looks a lot more balanced so in lieu with today's topic we're going to be linking our past way of eating to our present and again using that information to to reshape our future so as I was thinking about what to talk about today, I was like, well, what's something I hear a lot? And one thing that came to mind was um, when we talk about linking our past, I hear a lot of people say, well, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, they ate like this and they lived a long, healthy life, right? Um, and so what I'm really hearing as a clinician is they ate like this, so I'm going to eat like this too, and I'm going to be able to live just as long and just as healthy as, as they did um, by this style of eating because it worked for them, so why wouldn't it work for me? And again, as the uh, professional and as the expert here, I have to consider all of the facts, right? So we have to look at the bigger picture and beyond basically just like what is on your plate. And so that's when I start digging and asking the questions and kind of get you, get the wheels turning and get you to thinking um, and, and seeing where I'm coming from uh, to understand that I'm not just being the bad guy here. <laughs> so it's, one of the questions that comes to mind is, okay, so what did your ancestors eat, right? And so like Yolanda touched on a little bit is um, we came from eating, you know, a lot of plant-based fruits and vegetables, minimal meat until when we were brought into America and we were fed pretty much scraps. And so what did that look like for us? It looked like a bunch of chitlins and, you know, the feet of the animal, the tail of the animal, the fat parts, the gizzards, the liver, you know, the organs that the, the other people didn't want to eat. They just passed them on to us. So it was a lot of, of scrap foods that we had to make work for us. And and because we are just black magic, we made it work very well because now people are um, of all cultures are selling these same animal parts that we were forced to eat and making a profit off of it. So we were able to make it work for us um, under the circumstances that we were dealt with. Um, but you want to think about what did they eat and then why did they eat that way? Um, and so it, it, it wasn't just because they wanted to, but that was just what they had. Um, and then what did their portion size look like? So, I mean, if you think about it, they weren't just, you know, putting as much food as they wanted on their plates, right? So thinking about, you know, did they have to portion this out to make sure everybody ate? Did anybody have to sacrifice eating that day so that somebody else could eat, maybe a child or a husband or whatever the case may be? Um, so thinking about that, like, and, or how many times a day did they eat? So, you know, it's, it's not looking like the traditional or what we preach today or what you hear is, eat three, you know, try to eat three meals and get a couple of snacks in between. I'm pretty sure they weren't doing that in slavery. Like, they just had to eat when they could. So they don't have that luxury of eating when they're, they're hungry. Like I tell my clients today, let your body guide you and let it tell you when you're hungry, when you're full and all of that. So they didn't have that luxury like we, we do today. And then what was their lifestyle like? So that is a big factor. You know, they didn't have cars. They didn't have Uber. They didn't have Lyft. They didn't have delivery services. They didn't have, you know, you can drive up to, uh, I have Walmart and Kroger, but you can't just drive up to the grocery store and pop your trunk open and boom, they put the groceries in there, right? So they had to walk to the store or they had to bike to the store. Um, so their lifestyle is completely different and it's not as sedentary as we are today where things are just available literally at our fingertips. Um and so taking all of that into consideration, yes, they did eat high fat, high salt, um, maybe even high, high sugary foods. However, on the flip side, they were very, very active, whether it was working in the farm, whether it was, you know, having to pick cotton, they were out in the heat, they were constantly moving that body to be able to that well to, to not be able to let that that fat have really have an effect on their bodies um and so when you take all of that into consideration and then even the fact that now we have like fast food places or food options 
every block, right? So they didn't have they didn't have that then. So taking all of that into consideration, it is understandable why we. Um, I hate to say can't, but we have to be much more cautious of how we eat um, because all of the factors are not the same. So you don't want to put yourself into that box of thinking um, just because they ate like this. I should be able to eat like this and live the same life because the variables have now changed. Um, but again, like I like to tell my clients, think about this. We are breaking years and years and years and years of habits. And we're not going to be able to do that in, in a 90 day period, a six month period, or even a one year period. So again, being kind and patient with yourself and understanding why that bond is there and why that bind is there and why we need to break it. So the big question is, how do you break that bind? Number one, you need to know what you are bound to. As I always tell people, know, um, know what battle you're fighting and know what tools to bring to the war. Um, so if you are fighting the wrong battle, then you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. So know what you're, you're bound to, and then also know what drives that bound. So if you're bound to sugary foods or salty foods, you need to understand what created that. What is driving that for you? And nine times out of 10, it is not even food related. You don't eat that way because you're hungry. Um, you don't eat that way because you're you're incompetent or anything like that. But there is something else that, that is really attaching you to that food. And you need to figure out what that is so that you can address that issue. And then you start to detach yourself from whatever it is that you're bound to, which gets me to the third tool or to the third tip is to get the tool that will help you start to detach yourself. Um, so what do those tools look like? It is not avoidance. It is not avoiding the donuts and the cookies and the cakes. That is not how you break that bind. Um, but it is more so getting that control, being in control of what you eat so that you can make the honest decision and say yes or no, I'm going to eat that. And your feelings, get this, this is what's the most important. You have neutral feelings. So you feel the same way whether you say yes or no to that food item. There's no guilt. There's no regret. No, no nothing like that. You are you're just okay um, with whatever decision you choose to make and knowing that there's no right or wrong. So with that, um, if, if you follow me, I don't believe in diets um, because diets kind of tell you what to, what's okay, appropriate to eat and what's inappropriate to eat. But the thing is, when you come off of that diet, you fall right back into the binds that you were, that were already there. So all they do is mask it for a little bit of time. They don't teach you how to break that bind. Um, and so that is what is the key is truly learning how to break that by so that you can be in control of your diet you can be in control of your your plate you can be in control of your cravings um so i what i do is i give you the tools that you need and you build your own diet you build your own foundation and it is something that works for only you um and that is what's so special and unique about it so um with all of that said, that is pretty much the, the end of my presentation, but um, I am definitely available for questions. Um, I do have a couple of options available to help you break that bind if you are bound to any type of food or any type of way of eating, or if you feel like you have some type of food addiction, I'm definitely here to serve you. Those who are on today and those who check our replay. Pay, it, paid attention to what you said because you hit upon some very important parts um, that we should all consider, you know, as we try to live a healthy um, life. So for me, I'm going to start with is BMI affected by ethnicity? So BMI is the body mass index um, levels as a stepping stone, if you will, to exercise or to an exercise conversation. And how do we deem that as being healthy in 2022? Okay, so yes, BMI does differ considerably by ethnicity and we can vary among subpopulations as well if we wanna break down the conversation. So with an ethnicity because of the environmental um, factor, by the lifestyle factor, for example, people, Black people who live in urban areas, um, their BMI levels will be 
perhaps differently than those that live in the rural areas. So we know that back in the day, the 1600s, I gave a, a brief of what the diet was. Okay, so as um, 16, diet of the 1600s for so black people, we were looking at a diet, diet extremely high in starch and fat, okay? Which many times has contributed to malnutrition and vitamin deficiencies, um, which Quentin has also discussed further on. So we know that these high calorie diets typically work, were worked off during a long day. You know, our people work from morning to dusk. So probably a little bit more than our typical eight hours a day that we, we do now for um, our nine to five jobs. So what does that mean? Okay. They worked off through long hours of working in the fields and in the house on the plantation. So this was the exercise concept and whatever level, it, whatever they had going on, it leveled itself off in terms of health wise. So though the food may not have been good, they were actually doing activities, those who could do activities, because we know those, it, if you had any ailments and things going on, you probably worked in a, another part or in the house. And you know, it's like all these different components and all of that. So if you did the working and did all of that kind of stuff, you actually burned off um, what you needed to burn off by eating the food that you were eating. So in 2022 many of us works work at jobs where we sit at a desk for eight hours so once we clock out we usually go to our car and then we drive home and then we eat the kinds of food mentioned with high calories without incorporating any type of physical activity in our day-to-day -day. <clears throat> so sitting is good however you need to walk and try to um build up some type of physical um components <laughs> okay it can't just be you slide over here to this part of your desk and you slide back to the other part of your desk that's not exercise and i know i've spoken for this series that i was doing where the um the guideline in terms of how much exercise a week that each per person should be doing, I think children would be a little bit more because they have extra um, energy and all of that. That's like a whole other conversation. But for adults, we're looking at 150 minutes a week. So we're talking about 25 minutes for five days, okay? Um, and you break out the days however you want to break it out. So um, those are things to think about because it's important because when we eat these kind of foods mentioned with high calories and so forth and we don't put in the day-to-day -day activity we do put ourselves at risk for heart disease colon related illnesses and neurological disorders and we already know as african-american caribbean whatever just say black people we are always always affected by whatever what ever disease is out there it, it tends to hit us extra hard and if you listen to what i said in terms of what our makeup was in terms of what our diet was right and now so many hundred years later you know what i mean it's like you have to really understand this whole the science of it all okay this is what we're made of however this is kind of what we're doing okay so poor dietary habits are the number one cause of premature death in the united states and according to the center for science and public interest unhealthy diet contributes to approximately 678,000 deaths a year okay so no longer following the standards of european dietary 
model that we have blindly followed or had no choice but to follow and try to make it our own. But we must make conscious efforts to choose wisely, okay, whether it's in food and whether it's in exercise. The two go together. The two really go together. So we must make conscious efforts to choose wisely. So making a goal change is about sticking to a goal or developing a goal. How do you want to live your life? As any small effort makes a change in your thinking about the effort in the past, here are some ideas to consider when turning the step forward and breaking the bind, okay? Be specific and what changes that you want you and your family to move forward, okay? Is it walking together perhaps every minute, every evening for 20 minutes, maybe before, after dinner, okay? Um, be specific exactly what it is that you are trying to do as you move forward with a healthy mindset, okay? Um, make sure the goal is measurable like if the goal is to walk every night at seven o'clock and you know you get home at 6 30 then you probably ain't gonna meet that goal of every evening at seven o'clock doing that 20 minute walk so just make it be mindful let it make sense let it be measurable and are your goals to fitness attainable or are you striving too high? You know, if you're saying you want to do the um the marathon and the marathon starts in six months, do you think you could really realistically get your body trained and ready to run a marathon in just six months? You have people who are training for like a year and change, you know what I'm saying? So don't strive too high, too high. And not only that, you really have to know yourself as to what you can and cannot do. And is it attainable? You know, again, uh, avoid aiming too high or too low. Realistically, losing 10 pounds a week sounds great, but we know, <laughs> okay, that's a huge feat, okay? So that means if I'm telling you, you need to be in the gym, realistically 25 to 30 minutes let's say a day really five days but let's say if you're trying to lose 10 pounds within a week so let's rev it up to seven days but we also know the body is the body you still need to rest you know because if you're new to exercise you're going to be sore those first couple of days so you really have to be mindful of that you know, the, the body is an engine, but it does have to rest because it won't give you the energy to do what it is that you seek to do. So realistically, the 10 pounds is, is a reach. <laughs> it's a reach, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then with, if you put the diet aspect of it, so that's like, okay, what are you doing? Drinking water and eating a cracker a day? you know, that's probably not the most healthy way to go about it. And then lastly, we're talking about timing, like choose specific um, goals within a, a timeline that makes sense. You know, I think sometimes a lot of us, we overseek in terms of this is what you want, like it, in the patient's level is very small with most people, where they want it now, they want, that big butt tomorrow, they don't wanna do those squats, you know, or those other low um, body exercises that can perhaps get you to that along with your diet, right? A lot of people, they want it like now. So they go for those BBLs, they go for the surgery. I mean, whatever you do is whatever you do, but what happens when you do those things, right? You still want to maintain that big butt, okay? That's that flat stomach. Like if you eating at McDonald's every day, um, that that ain't gonna work after you done spent all that money. So it's still a consistent goal that you can kind of reach 
now, <laughs> like the regular way. <laughs> the thing that I thought was interesting, just to go over briefly, when we talk about the BMI, that's really an important factor for a lot of people when they're seeking the diet aspect and the fitness aspect, okay? Your weight measurements make a difference. Not so much as what the scale is saying in terms of, you know, your weight, but think about it to your midsection, you know, different areas of your body. Like what it, what is your measurement and is it within the guideline ratio that it should be? So people who are underweight, they're what 18, 18.5 is like what what the the average should should be or whatever normal is 18.5 to 24.9 in terms of if you measure your waist okay it's considered overweight if your waist area is 25 to 29.9 and then it's considered obese if your waistline is 30 to 34.9 and extremely obese is 20 35 and up so what does that mean well these are things as i mentioned as be specific or what your fitness goals are this is like an important aspect to consider exactly what is it you're trying to do you're not just trying to do exercises just to do exercises because just like quinn said you follow your typical diet that can like phase out you know what I'm saying? It really has to make sense to what it is you're trying to do. You can't just, you can do it, but we already know the consistency after a while that dies off for some people, like, especially if they don't see the developments that they, in the results right away, they'll feel like oh, I'm just doing, I've been exercising for like two months and I'm barely losing weight. Okay, there's other factors. What you're eating? <laughs> Are you really working out every day? Like, what else is kind of going on? Are you on medications? Because those meds can also affect, you know, the, the end result in terms of that. You know, health is wealth, you know, and I've said this as well. Like, a lot of people who I speak with in the different sectors that I'm in, these are small Black business owners, women business owners. So it's good that we grind in for that money. We're trying to get these businesses together, but health is well. If you are sickly or if you're not eating right, or if you're not doing some form of exercise, it, it, it just doesn't correlate in terms of, um, okay, you're trying to get this business here. However, you're not doing what you need to do health-wise. You know what I'm saying? It just, it just doesn't kind of go together. So we have Quinn to Central Solutions. Quinn, do you want to talk about what I have on the screen, which I didn't put in the chat, but I'm gonna try to do that now while you're talking. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So um with Quinn to Central Solutions, no, that's fine. You can go right there. Um I offer a um I like to call it a, a mini e-course. Um and it is called Ditch Your Diet. And what that does is help you identify. So like we talked about before, identify what you are bound to and identify uh, why you are bound to it. So we um, talk about, you know, we get down to the nitty gritty, I will say that. So I take you through some exercises. I have worksheets in there that will ask you some questions that will help you figure out exactly what it is that you need to work on when it comes to your diet. And like I said, it is not just food. So I already know that you know that fruits and vegetables are healthy. So that is not what I'm, I'm necessarily asking. We do talk about that a little bit, but it's not just, are you eating five fruits and vegetables and are you eating whole grains and are you eating meats? No, I'm asking you things like, what do you pass by on your way to work? Um, you know, it's because we need to know about the triggers that that's some things you don't even think about, you know, like, what are you seeing on TV? What is feeding into you? Because all of that can be um, part of why you are gravitating towards certain types of foods, but you don't think about that because you don't know. Um, and so we, we talk about all those things and um, just help you really unveil 
all of those those uh, hurdles that you need to overcome. So it is called Ditch Your Diet. It has some modules in there. Um, and the price is $67 for attendees today. So if you go ahead on there, you can get in for that price. You have lifetime access. Um, and then also I am offering a free 30 minute consultation. So once you purchase it, I'll be able to see who bought it um, from the, uh, I'm sorry, from the webinar today. And then I will reach out so that we can go ahead and get that 30 minute consultation scheduled. Sounds good. Sorry, I'm t I thought I could copy over the link. <laughs> it's not okay, letting you okay. that. So I had to write it in the, um, the, the chat thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so with chronic fitness, I think I put it out in the universe. We just revised or relaunched our website. So we have some cool programs with more uh, tailored to what it is people are seeking. Um, the social media is what I have there. I'm on Instagram, chronic, it, chronic underscore fitness underscore biz. Facebook is chronic fitness. Twitter is cfit577555581. I don't know why Twitter did it that way, but I don't know. But that that's my own um, thing. So what I'm giving this evening, well, I'm going to have this up for the weekend because um, our audience members, for those who weren't able to catch it tonight, you know, I'll just pass the word. I'll leave this up until Sunday. So I'm doing a one-to-one -one bundle where I'm giving a 30-minute goal fitness assessment um, conversation. Then I'm doing, um, I'm providing a two-day exercise e-guide, which you can read at your own convenience in terms of exercise that you can try out, including the, um, the warm-up, the routine, and the cool-down. So you have two days' worth of tailored uh, exercises to go with. Then I'm giving you a virtual fitness badge for attending today. Um, and then Monday, I'm doing a live session just for those who purchased this before um, Sunday. And I'll provide the link based on that. So I'm doing a 20, 25 minute um, Instagram live access only special. So this one to one bundle will be $35 for anybody that's interested in that. It's a steal. So catch it because Sunday and that goes away. Part of marketing this was people, you have access to a registered certified dietitian, which is rare. Okay. So if you don't take advantage of that, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. Ditch your diet, the deal. Quinn already gave you those details. And then you have a certified personal trainer. So just wanted to throw that out there when people look at this, because I may add this little part conversation. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. But if there's no further questions, I will say I hope everyone has a glorious weekend and happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth.